When it comes to this matter of the gift of the Holy Spirit, all of you who have taken the foundation or class know that the gift is the God-given ability. And that believers operating the nine manifestations produce the fruit of the Spirit. The prophet with all of that fruit of the Spirit is recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'd like for you to look at it, please. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to whom? Every man. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The profit with all, this means the ultimate profit with a view to that which is beneficial. The immediate profit is not always totally visible. And you just cannot go by immediate profit. You have to look at the immediate profit and then follow it down the line to the ultimate. If it's still profitable, ultimately, then it's right on. If it isn't profitable, ultimately, it's right off. It's as simple as that. And the counterfeit is so much like the genuine. You have to be working the integrity of God's Word and put it in your head and heart to rightly divide it. This week I'm going to have everybody reading some things in the class, things outside of the Word, to show you men how they divide the Word of God so that you become versatile in your understanding of the integrity and accuracy of the Word, so that you get knowledgeable. Because this, as I told you, isn't a second-rate week. This is one of the greats. Boy, the abundance of the Word that will be here, the ability that you will have after this week to really rightly divide the Word in the operation of the manifestations of interpretation and prophecy. And you'll know all the baloney that's taught by all these beautiful, other wonderful, so-called Christian groups. A bunch of baloney. That's right. If God's Word is right. Look at Matthew chapter 9. You can't go by man's opinion. You've got to go by the Word. Men come and go, but this Word's going to live a while. Matthew chapter 9, verse 8. Listen to this. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. I'm too far. I want a Matthew 9, what did I say? Matthew 9, 8. Okay, here we are. Still a good verse. Let's go back up one. You see, back in verse 5, Jesus had been talking to the Pharisee gangs and the rest of them. And he said, whether it's easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and what? Right. He arose and departed to his house, verse 7, verse 8. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power unto whom? Right. It was a right-on trip. It was rightly done. That's the prophet in it. The man was set free, but there he doesn't just wasn't immediately set free. He was set free, set free all along till the ultimate prophet was also realized. Show you another one from Acts chapter 8. Acts 8, verse 9. There was a certain man called Simon, who before time in the same city used sorcery. This was in Samaria. And bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was somewhat. In the record in Matthew, we just read they glorified God because God had given such power unto whom? In Acts, they glorified whom? The man, that's the counterfeit. He had the multitudes at his feet. That doesn't make any difference. 
He bewitched the people a long time, giving out that himself was the what? Great one. That's right. He was the big guy on the totem pole. Counterfeit. That's why you have to know the word to know the ultimate prophet in it. Because the truth of God's word will always have a prophet in it, not only immediate, but ultimately. In 1 Corinthians 14, 23, listen to this. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say you're what? <laughs> right. They should. That you're off your rocker. Spe nothing the matter with speaking in tongues, but if everybody speaks in tongues at the same time in the church, how are they body, how's the body going to be edified? Then it's not ultimately for what? That's why it's counterfeit. It's out of order. Nothing wrong with speaking in tongues, it's the speaking in tongues would still be genuine. It's the usage of it that would make it out of order. Now, tonight I want to begin backwards. <laughs> Things that I ordinarily conclude the TIP class with, for instance, in essence, or it's at least way in the body of that. I want to take this group tonight and work it backwards for you to show you some of the greatness. To show you the, the wonderful fruit of the Spirit that your life will produce this week and from this week on out if you walk on God's Word. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, what else, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, verse 23, meekness, temperance, against such there is no what? Right. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The first fruit of the Spirit mentioned is the word love. This is the love of God in the renewed mind in manifestation. This fruit of the Spirit springs from the admiration and adoration of one so tremendous that one has absolutely no doubt about his commitment. It means choosing one's object of utmost commitment by the freedom of one's decision of the will. That's what that fruit of the Spirit means. Literally, this fruit of the Spirit devotes itself like a pointed Damascus sword unalterably to its fulfillment, to the goal for which it is moving with relentless devotion. That's the meaning of this, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. If that's true, then don't tell me we haven't got a week rolling. Well, it's true. The first thing it says is that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Well, what kind of love? The kind I've just defined for you. It's the kind of love that John 3.16 talks about. For God, so what? Love. God so loved. I said it's like a pointed Damascus steel sword. 
It's pointed. It knows where it's going. God so loved. It's not a wishy-washy kind of thing. It's not the kind of love where one day you stand for the Lord and the next day you cop out. You make up your mind God's word is right come hell or high water. Whether Lily's supported or not don't make a lousy bit of difference. It's still God's word. If nobody supports it, it's still God's word. If nobody believes it, it's still God's word. That's love. And don't come around and tell me you've got all kinds of love and one minute you're walking, the next minute you're blowing every which way like a little old grain of sand. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit are the results of the operation of the manifestation. When I don't see the fruit, I know you're not operating manifestations because the Word says the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit are the results of the operation of the manifestation. And this week, we're in that great part of the summer where we're going to be dealing dynamically with speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy, which enable us to produce fruit of the Spirit, the first of which is love. Look at 1 John, the epistle. For God so loved you all know, John 3, 16. But I wonder if you know 1 John 4, 19 as well. <laughs> Bless you. Listen to this. This is the same usage as the one I've just defined. I'm giving you the usages. There are many more, but I picked out some tonight just to set this stuff like a diamond for you. We love him because he first did what? Right. Jesus Christ set his life like steel, pointed steel toward the goal because of his love. That's the usage of Galatians 5.22 when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love. Secondly, joy. That word joy means to be lit up with light. I don't know what that means, but that's what it means. First of all, your light, and then to be lit up with light. That's the literal meaning of the word joy. To be lit up with light. It is a brilliance or an effulgence. It is an effervescence within you. You're really tickled to death. And I'll show you one from Hebrews 12 too. Well, we sing showers of blessing, I don't know. <laughs> this joy that I'm speaking about from Galatians 5 is the usage in 12.2 of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising what? Right, and is set down at the right hand of God, the throne of God. Who for the joy that was set before him? Who for what? Endured what? Right. Can you see any joy there in a cross? Well, Jesus Christ must have. And that's the usage, the same word as the word in Galatians 5. Well... I think maybe you want to sit out in the rain or you want to go in. Ah, it ain't raining. You better cover these things up, though. You got things to cover with? I don't know anything you better do except you better get in your cars because it's going to rain. Cover your stuff up on the double. Everything on the double, boys. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and then peace. You know what this word means? No fuss, no muss. <laughs> That's really something. It means the end of the fight.
it's used in a, in a negative sense in a most remarkable way when the criminal has been captured, handcuffed, and all tied up, no fight left in him. That's, that's used this way on the negative side. <laughs> it's real significant, the usage thereof. It means untroubled. The fruit of the Spirit, it's untroubled. It's undisturbed. It's an inner tranquility. The Hebrew or Aramaic word is shalom or salom in Hindi. It is literally a state of being quiet or a state of quietness. Colossians 3.15 uses it beautifully. Listen to this. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. If it rules, it has that supremacy, that tranquility that I'm talking about. In the Bible, they use words like the gospel of peace. To be spiritually minded is this joy, this peace. The peace in believing is another usage in the word. Corinthians says he's not the author of confusion, but of what? Peace, as in all the churches. Another usage is the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That cohesive, coherent element. In the Old Testament, it referred to one that Abraham, didn't he pay tithes to the king of Salem, who is the king of peace, it says. Also, an interesting usage is regarding Rahab, the innkeeper, at whose home the spies resided. The Word of God says, And Rahab received the spies with peace. How would you like to have been in Rahab's shoes? That's the word peace that's used in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Rahab received the spies. Her life was in danger to the uttermost. Yet it says she received those spies with peace. That woman had tapped into something. The tremendous usage of it. And the greatest I know is in the Word of God where it says Jesus Christ is the Prince of what? Peace. That's pretty good. Now it says love, joy, peace, and the fourth one is long-suffering. The word long-suffering literally means long on love. That's what it literally means. One who is long-suffering is long on love. The love of God in the renewed mind, he's long on love, means to be enduring, forgiving, patient. Another usage literally is long on your equilibrium before becoming angry. <laughs> that is quite a usage of the word long-suffering. This is one of the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we're after this week in the sessions that are here at the International Headquarters. In Ephesians chapter 4, here's one of the usages of it. Listen to it. 4. 
verse 2. Well, it says in verse 1, I beseech you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. Walk worthy of it. Then that great second verse, with lowliness of, and meekness, with what? Long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. There's your usage. Long-suffering. That's the walk worthy of the vocation wherewith God in Christ called us. In Colossians chapter 1 is a similar usage. Verse 11. Verse 10 again says that you might what? Walk worthy. Verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Long-suffering with joyfulness. I told you it was long on your equilibrium. You don't get thrown off a of balance before you become angry about any situation. It is to have patience. It is to be able to endure Literally, it means to be able to stand people. <laughs> okay. The next fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned is gentleness. This literally means a soothing goodness that manifests itself in kindness one to another. It's a soothing goodness that manifests itself among the body of believers in kindness one to another. The best illustration I know from the usage of these words in the Word would apply to how a mother would take up the little child and would pat it and say, Now, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. They just keep saying, Don't cry. And while she says, don't cry, she holds the baby, baby close to her breast and pats it a little bit. That's the soothing part of it. In 2 Timothy, you have a usage of it. 2 Timothy 2. Verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not what? But be gentle unto all. Gentle unto all. That literally means that this servant of the Lord, one who serves his fellow men, has to bring people to his breast and say, No, no, it's all right. Get quiet, man or woman. Pat them. Tenderly. That's this word. The fruit of the Spirit. In First Thessalonians is another usage. In verse 5 he says, Neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others. But, verse 7, we were what? Gentle. Gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. Even as a mother would nourish the children. That's the usage of this word gentleness, one of the fruit of the Spirit. The next usage is the word goodness in Galatians 5. The word goodness literally means sharp operator. <laughs> one who is a sharp operator to advantage the moral quality in his life. One who has sterling attractiveness. 
one who has a harmonious perfection within himself. That's this goodness, the fruit of the Spirit. In Romans 15, In verse 14, it says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. That's that harmonious perfection that sterling attractiveness that the believer has, which is one of the fruit of the Spirit. In 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 11, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you what? Worthy. Worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness. Fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness or goodness and the work of believing with power. Not a tremendous usage. Fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, which is the harmonious perfection, to operate sharply to the advantage of the moral quality within your life. It's like personality is what you are when people see you. Character is what you are in the dark by yourself or something. That's right. That's your moral quality. When people aren't watching you or observing you. The next, of course, fruit of the Spirit is that called faith. It really means believing. And in Mark 11, of course, is the greatest along this line. I do not need to spend much time on this because this one I've drilled into your heads before. Mark 11, 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not, what? Yeah. Doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, do what? Believe. Believe. That's the fruit of the Spirit. The next one is the word meekness. The word meekness means humility. The word meekness means humility. Tender. One who is free from haughty self-sufficiency. Where they go around and say, well, I did so and so and I did so and so. The fruit of the Spirit is meekness. Tender. Free from that kind of haughty self-sufficiency. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Four twenty one. Verse twenty says the kingdom of God is not in word, but in what? Power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love? And in the spirit of what? Meekness. See? Paul could have boasted of his self sufficiency. He says, I was born of the stock of so and so and so and so, remember? Sat at the feet of Gamaliel. 
But in it, he says that all of those things which were gained to him, he counted but as what? For the excellency of the knowledge that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's this word meekness. Second Corinthians has a beautiful usage in chapter 10. Verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of what? Christ. Isn't that something? The meekness of Christ. Free from haughty, haughty self-sufficiency. Christ certainly had something he could have bragged about on, he, on his own, right? But he was what? Meek. Meek. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what you become when you operate the manifestations and believe God's Word. And the final one is the word temperance in Romans. Temperance literally means dominion of self. Self-discipline, self-control. Temperance used to mean to me the Sunday school lesson once a quarter. I see some of the rest of you have been the same fold, huh? No beer, no wine. They never got the next phrase. But uh, that's not what temperance means. I used to get so tickled about the WCTU in Van Wert. Women's Christians Temperance Union or whatever it was. You got to be over 85 to join. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> and the point was, they never talked temperance. They always talked total abstinence. And I wonder where he got the name temperance from. I was even confused then. But the word temperance literally means self-discipline. Control of self. The fruit of the Spirit brings you to this place where you have temperance, control of self. But you can't have the fruit of the Spirit without operating the manifestations. When you operate the manifestations, like with tongues and interpretation tonight, with the word of prophecy, we were edified. We understood what God had to say. Therefore, in the light of that, we renew our minds and we walk on it and we manifest this self-control this temperance, this self-discipline. I don't discipline myself because the neighbor says I have to. I discipline myself because it's a fruit of the Spirit. I hear what God has to say. I read what He has to say. And by the freedom of my will, I utilize it. Acts 24 has a dandy usage of this. Acts 24. Verse 24. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he, as he, Paul, reasoned of righteousness and what? Amen. Temperance and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered. He said, that's enough, man. Cut her off. That's enough. Go thy what? Amen. Yeah. When I have convenient season, I'll call you again. Ha, ha, ha. When he dealt with self-control. If you know the history of Felix, he didn't have too much of it. 
and his little wife, Drusilla. So naturally, when Paul was reasoning of the righteousness and temperance what? Nine fruit of the Spirit. The manifestations, when they are operated according to God's Word, will produce those fruit. But you do not produce a fruit on a tree without properly cultivating it, the ground, fertilizing it, proper sunshine and rain, a lot of things involved. So this week, while we're in these great classes here, it's just not a second-rate week. It is a week of primary importance for people who want to produce the fruit of the Spirit. In all of the greatness that I've said it before you tonight, and I've worked these words in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 with a minute exactness so that we would get it out of people's heads that it's just a seminar. Well, it is not just a seminar. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God's always fantastic. This is why love activates by doing Joy encourages with effervescence. Peace guards by quietness. Long-suffering forbears and endures by doing actively. Gentleness wins by encouraging. Goodness guards by ministering. Faith or believing appropriates the answer. And meekness encourages positive results. And temperance or self-control guards the results. Those are the usages of those nine fruit of the Spirit. And they just set like diamonds in Galatians 5. And then it concludes by saying, Against such there is no what? Couldn't be any because it's so far beyond law, law can't even smell it. That's right. It's so far, it's, it's so far beyond law because you're living so dynamically and so beautifully. These are the kind of things that I have in my heart and think about when our people walk on God's Word. It says we're a sweet smell, Chanel 5 or something. <laughs> you know, you just smell good because about all you get in the world among other people basically is a rotten smell. Then when you go in there smelling so good, you just bring the perfume of heaven into concretion with the love of Christ in your soul. And that is literally fantastic. That's the usage of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, and that's what we're here for this week. Now, this is taking it backwards, because later on this week, of course, we'll be moving into the manifestation, exactly what happens when a person's right on with interpretation. How do you interpret to be right on? How do you know when you're right on? What's the profit in it? Not only immediate, but ultimate. When a word of prophecy is given, when do we give words of prophecy? When do we speak in tongues and interpret? That's the kind of word we're going to be in this week, night after night, day after day. And as I said to you earlier tonight, you're going to be doing some reading. These are my junk tables out here. This is the kind of stuff I've had to wade through for years to get to the integrity and accuracy of the Word and see that the Word still fits and what they have written is a counterfeit. 
and you've got to be able to prove it. No teacher just gets up and says, well, this is what the Bible says. It has to fit what he says. It has to work with the integrity and accuracy of God's Word. And you have to become so versatile in the usage of God's Word that you can read anything and separate out truth from error. And you don't learn that overnight. And I guarantee you, you don't learn it without self-control. Now, you see why it's going to be a great week? It's got to be great because it's the greatness of God's Word. And it's that Word that has set us free as far as we've gone. Without that Word, we'd still be fumbling around in left field trying to catch a ball or roll after it. But that Word took us out of the cesspools of sin and iniquity and set us on our high places. It's that word that has made it possible for us to live dynamically. Now, it says fruit of the Spirit. If somebody else comes along and says it means fruit of good works, that's their privilege. My word says it's fruit of the Spirit. Had God meant fruit of good works, you know what he'd have said? Fruit of good works. He's not stupid. It's not a fruit of good works, it's the fruit of what? Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit produces the works in evidence of love, joy, peace, and so forth. That's the fruit. And once you operate that, you see the signs, miracles, and wonders in people's lives get blessed. 